Southeast Asia specialists and, and, and those from, from Japan as well. Uh, so very pleased to have Suihiro Sensei uh, with us today and I'll introduce him uh, in just a moment. Um, today we're, we're going to talk uh, not just about the economy but about the political economy in general. Uh, Suihiro Sensei's initial presentation will, will, will focus uh, on the economy, but it's, it's hard to separate that from, from social dynamics in the country and, and political dynamics uh, as well. Um, obviously, each of our countries, uh, the United States and Japan, uh, are, are uh, deeply engaged in Thailand, but we're, we're, we're facing a certain amount of tension uh, as well. As you know, Assistant Secretary Danny Russell was uh, in Bangkok not too long ago uh, to, uh, and, and, and gave a speech uh, in, in many ways um, talking about uh, the desire to see uh, certain um, restrictions lifted in, in, in Thailand. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the Thai Prime Minister was, was in Tokyo meeting with Prime Minister Abe and, and talking about their economic uh, engagement programs. Um, clearly, the Thai economy is uh, suffered a little bit last year, less than 1% growth. And, and it's not clear how, uh, whether or not it will be able to keep up with its, its neighbors. I think the, the current forecast is about 3. 0.5% growth for, for, for the coming year. Um, so uh, there are a lot of questions about uh, how businesses will respond in, in, in Thailand and, uh, and how the government will respond as well. So that's what uh, Professor Suihiro Sensei is going to, uh, to, to help us uh, understand. He is a professor at the Institute for Social Science uh, at the University of Tokyo and, and truly one of Japan's top uh, Thai uh, scholars on the political economy. He was the director of that institute up until 2012, uh, began teaching at the University of Tokyo in 1992, uh, and also taught at uh, IDE JETRO, uh, JETRO's Institute for Developing Economies uh, in the 1990s as well. Uh, truly a, a tireless and, and uh, passionate scholar, he, he uh, uh, spent time focused on many other Southeast Asian countries as well, but, but uh, his primary focus has been Thailand. He's uh, collected over 2,200 uh, Thai books and manuscripts and, manuscripts and, and uh, um, uh, uh, students' dissertations, cremation volumes that he's brought back to uh, the University of Tokyo, and there is a Suihiro collection there in the Asia uh, uh, Research Library. Uh, so he um, uh, truly has a passion in this area. Um, primarily writes on the Thai economy and business sector, but also politics and society in general. And um, uh, we're, we're, we're very pleased to, to have him here today. After Suihiro Sensei uh, finishes his uh, initial presentation, uh, we're also very fortunate to have uh, two other gentlemen with us with a deep knowledge of, of, of Thailand. Uh, Luis uh, Brewer, uh, to my left, is a mission chief uh, for Thailand at the IMF, and uh, just recently returned uh, last month, just a few weeks ago, from. Uh, leading a team, uh, an IMF team for the Article 4 consultations in, in Thailand. Uh, so great timing there. He's, he's been at the IMF for 15 years now and has been mission chief for the Solomon Islands, Jamaica, uh, serving in a variety of other posts in, in Asia and Latin America. Uh, and then we have John Brandon to our left uh, and uh, a good friend. He is director of the Asia Foundation's regional cooperation programs as well as the associate director of uh, the Washington DC office here. He began studying in Thailand uh, and the Thai language in the 1970s, uh, has a long uh, experience in Thailand and in Southeast Asia as well, has been working at the Asia Foundation now for 25 years or so. Um, and uh, he's, he's a, a big part of why the, the foundation has done such great work uh, on this region, I believe. So uh, thank you, John, for, for being with us. Uh, so Suihiro Sensei, I give you the floor yes. and we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and Sabadi Kap Tukta Ti Kama Ruam Tini Kap. Today, I appreciate very much the uh, Jim Shof and the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And it is a very good chance for me to visit Washington and have uh, so many chance to discuss with the uh, many uh, distinguished scholars, including the Brandon and uh, Mr. Royce in IMF. So today's, this morning sessions, I would like to address my ideas on the uh, two aspects of Thailand economy. The first one is the, what is the middle income trap facing Thailand. 
in actuality, I cannot agree with the idea of Thailand uh, middle income trap because Thailand did not yet fall in the trap of middle income country because Thailand entered into the upper middle income country just in 2010. So it is very difficult to say that the Thailand is now falling into the trap of upper middle income countries. So the, that is the first uh, the topics. And the second topics, uh, it's, I, I am the studies about uh, uh, local farms, especially the Thai big business groups, including a family business. And I would like to introduce the, some new strategy undertaken by this Thai local big firms. Uh, this is the second topic. So the, I overview the Thai economy for the past 15 years. Uh, from the 2000 to the uh, last year, 2014, average annual growth rate is the 3.94%. Not so high as compared to China, with 7% to the 8%. And uh, please look at the up down of the. This is the 1997 Asian crisis. This is the 2008 worldwide financial crisis. And this is the uh, flat in the 2011. But, uh, after them, the up-down is maybe some important element is the political unrest or the political turmoil. But I think that the Thailand economy is mostly determined by the factors outside Thailand, such as financial crisis or the Asian currency crisis. And the growth, economic growth, the which element contributed to the economic growth in Thailand, I think that the two major elements. One is export. Please look at the quickly increase and in export. And now face the stagnant. This is a very crucial point. The second is the domestic consumption. Especially for the past five or the six years, uh, two sectors is to contribute to the increasing domestic consumption. One is automobile. Another one is housing especially low price housing. And now, we can look at the so many changes in trade structure. First one is the export destination. Unfortunately, United States and Japan dropped down for the past two decades. By contrast, ASEAN countries is the impressively increase to now arrive at the 26%. And also China is now increasing and now exceeding the market share of Japan and the United States now. So the, for Thailand, the most important and big trade partner is now ASEAN countries and China. Second point in the composition of the trade structure, export structures. Please look at the pink colors is agriculture, agro-industry, and government. This is under the control of local firms, not foreign firms. And agriculture in 1981 is the, as, much, as many as 49 or the, uh, nearly 50%, but dropped down to the less than 10%. Agro-industry still continue to occupy, account for the 12%. What is imp impressive the change is the garment, textile and garment. Labor-intensive type of industry is now, they are reaching to the peak in around 99 and drop down to now merely 3.3%. And blue light color is now electronics and automobile is under the control of foreign firms, especially multinational corporation, MNC. And electronics is now the peak to the, in the year of 2000 and now drop down to 15%. And the most important, the now exportable product in Thailand is now automobile, including uh, auto parts. And please 
uh, keep in mind that the two important sectors is under the control of foreign farmers, not local farmers. So now, I think that the Thailand, Thai economy have the several obstacles or the problem. I think that I already mentioned that the first one is the stagnant in export and increase of minimum wage level is now jump to the 300 baht per day. And another one is the demographic changes. It's now Thailand is already entered into the country of aging society since the 2010. And now young generation, especially the working age population is now decreasing. This means that Thailand will face the shortage of labor force in the near future and in Indeed, Thailand now depends on the migrant workers coming from Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. And now these foreign, uh, only three countries, Myanmar, Laos, and uh, Cambodians, the migrant workers amounted to 1.8 million persons now. Uh, this is an increase of minimum wage. So then now I shift to the now the first uh, uh, big issues is the middle income trap. What is the meaning of the middle income trap? Usually, according to the international financial organizations, the definition of middle income trap is the Asian East Asian economies, including Thailand, is enjoyed have enjoyed the economic growth owing to the input of the cheap labor force and the cheap investment fund. But if the wage level is increasing and the uh, input of investment fund is in, in inefficient, so the growth rate is gradually decreasing. And uh, this middle income country is now as a fall in the trap between the high income country and the low income country. Because middle income country, if we will not promote the innovation, they cannot compete with high income country in the high value added product. On the other hand, the, this middle income country cannot compete with low income country too because labor, uh, wage level is increasing and uh, low cost advantage is now disappearing. So the, please look at this table. Thailand is a shift from lower middle income country to the upper middle, in, uh, upper middle income country is in the year of 2010, just same year with China. On the other hand, Malaysia, uh, Malaysia is the, uh, here. Malaysia is now enter into the middle income, uh, upper middle income countries, according to the definition of World Bank. Is in 1979, Malaysia is enter into this group, belong to this group, but drop down to the lower middle income country and come back to the upper middle income country in the year of 1991. But now, 23 or the 24 years, Malaysia con continue to stay in a category of upper middle income country. Do not step up into the high income country. Just Malaysia is now falling in the trap, middle income trap. But in the case of Thailand or the China, just is now enter into the category of upper middle income country. So I think that it is very difficult to say that the Thailand is now falling into the middle income trap. But Thailand is now facing the same or the similar problem with Malaysia or the China. This is the increasing wage level and uh, uh, low productivity in labor force. This is the comparison of the labor productivity as compared to the United States. So the, I put the level of United States is 100. So this is the index. So the Singapore 
or the Japan is the around uh, 96 or the 88 as compared to the United States. But Thailand merely 16 against the United States with 100. China is also only 13 against the United States with 100. Very low productivity. If the, we put the United States, it's 100. Second problem is R&D or the innovation in terms of the expenditures of R&D against the nominal GDP. Please look at the figures in Thailand. R&D expenditure against nominal GDP is in 1999, merely 0.12%. And in the 2010, still 0.24%. I think that now uh, three person is coming from the Thai embassy that I'm sorry that the Thai government has no effort to improve the R&D expenditure in national budget. So the please compare to the needs newly, uh, newly uh, emerging economies such as the Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan. It's now, a percentage is around 2% or the exceeding 2%. So the 2% is an important indicator too that shows the, the some country is how in, in active, active in promoting the R&D or the innovation. So the less than 1% is very inactive or the under development in the promotion of uh, promoting the innovation. So it's very clear that the Thailand is now, not so active in promoting the innovation in manufacturing sector. So, now, I move to the, now, is the Thai government and the private sector, the how to escape or the how to overcome the some conventional or the traditional pattern of the economic growth, such as the, under the, uh, strong pressure of increasing wage level and uh, increasing the cost of investment fund. So, first one is the Thailand is now target two major industries, IT industry and automobile. And Thailand is very happy to positioning in the some core center of the global supply chain of Japanese electronics industry and the Japanese the automobile, or the American automobile, European automobile. Thailand is a hub core center, and this is the global supply chain. But on the other hand, Thai government, especially National Economic and Social Development Board, NESDB, now suggest and demonstrate the new idea of creative economy, setagi sansan in Thai language. So, this is the, uh, some pictures as the, the one addressed by the ACOM. It's the Secretary General of NESDB, a close friend for the past 35 years <laughs> in Thailand. So according to the idea of the ACOM, in the Thailand, uh, the three steps. The first, uh, first step is that they uh, seek for the comparative advantage and the second stage step is the competitive advantage. Uh, and now, Thailand is now seek for the new step or a new stage of the innovation driving economy. But this area, what is interesting to me is the ARCOM suggests that uh, this is not manufacturing, but non-manufacturing sector. Very good case is super or a Thai food or the uh, healthcare service. And so this is a new idea, not manufacturing, uh, improvement of labor productivity in manufacturing. But now Thai government is now turn their eyes to non-manufacturing sector now. So now I shift to the second issues of the uh, Thailand uh, big firms the strategy and also the how is the growth of the service sector in Thailand. So this is the top 20 largest firms in Thailand in 2010. 
ピンクカラーショーズダーローカルファームズローカルビッグファームズチャーターとカラーイズダーガバメントリンクトカンパニーモスリーイズダーペトロレアムオートリティオブタイランドポートート PTT and light blue color is the shows the multinational corporation so the, it is very clear that the automobile is controlled by the foreign firms Japanese firms or the American firms electronics also by the European or the Japanese firms and the pink colors local firms is the gold trade or the CP Chalumpokapan food CP food And Indorama and the Indians, a joint venture with Indian and local firms. Or the TCC, Jaron, uh, Jaron TCC, the Thai beverage. So that there is no local firms in the electronics or the automobile industry now. So please look at this the table, 7 Eleven in the world market. So it's very surprising now. Thailand is the second largest country in terms of the number of stores of 7 Eleven following Japan. Japan is number one, and the United States is 7,800. Now, Thailand exceeding United States, second largest. Of course, the revenue or the sales per one store is smaller, by far smaller than the 7-Eleven in the United States. But this figure is showed how is the growth of the service sector in Thailand, in the whole country, not only in the Bangkok area, but in the countryside. Is the, we can easily find the 7-Eleven. And the 7-Eleven of CP Group has own university, Panyapiwat University. Now, this university trained, educated the staff of the CP711. And now, 6,000 students is enrolled in this university and the teaching by using uh, English, Chinese, and Japanese, not uh, Thai language. So the, they are very active in the training and the producing or the development of the human resources in this sector. And the second figure is the housing. <clears throat> After the Asian crisis in the 1997, housing industry business in Thailand is collapsed. But in recent 10 years, it's now come back and is now enjoyed the boom. And later, I will mention that now, the land price in Bangkok metropolitan area is increasing. The people cannot get obtained the white land site. So now they are interested not in land, but in housing, interior, or the, some in the uh, furniture, or the, some the, uh, designs of the housing. So the IKEA in Thailand is now marvelously gross in the recent five years because now people's interests now shift from land to the housing now. And this is the local big business groups, especially the family business in the strong stake in fish sector. One is agro industry. Second is the uh, property, housing, and uh, industrial estate. And the third group is shopping center or the convenience stores or the restaurant, Japanese restaurant. So many Japanese restaurants now in Bangkok And the last one is entertainment, especially the movie, films industry, and animation. So the now local big business groups or the Thai family business now is a strong stake in not in manufacturing sector, but in such the non-manufacturing sector of the service sector or the agro industry. Agro industry is, can use the local raw materials such as the sugar cane, natural rubber, uh, natural rubber, or the rice, the agriculture product. So the, it is the uh, agro-industry is now one of the uh, most important industry for Thailand appeared 
is the international competitiveness. So the, it is a mapping of the some business or the industrial segmentation among three groups. One is the state enterprises, second is multinational corporation, the third one is uh, local big business groups or the family business. So the family business can appeal their advantage is the utilization of domestic resources or know-how for local market. If the appeal to the high technology, so the multinational corporation is dominant. On the other hand, it's the uh, uh, horizontal line, is a, this is the degree of economic liberalization, and the uh, uh, right-hand side is now government regulation is still. So the, if the government regulation is the restrict the some entrance of the firms into the market, local market, so the, of course the local firms shows demonstrates the advantage in this field, such as the uh, telecommunication, housing, property business, and industrial estate. So the last part is the new strategy of Thai big corporation. So I divide it into the four groups. First one is a collapse <laughs> after the crisis. Mostly it's the automobile. Automobile, I can account the around the 10 groups engaged in automobile industry, but after the crisis, all of the groups is now de-invested from the automobile industry and uh, sold out the stock to the Japanese partner or American partner or the uh, new foreign uh, firms. And the steel industry also. And uh, some crops merchant export, uh, something like this, yeah, is now disappear. The second group is now very big group, growing bigger and bigger, such as the Pototo, PTT is the uh, formerly Petroleum Authority of Thailand, or the Siam Cement Group, SCG, or the Charun Pokapan Group, CP, or the TCC Group, or the Thai Beverage, and Indorama, the one, two, three, four, five, this is the big five. Haswa, Haswa, you know, five tigers in Thai uh, business sector. The second group is, a uh, third group is the revival and further expansion, such as the central group in department store or the shopping center, and the Saha group in consumer goods, and the uh, Sinha beer is the beverage and the non-alcohol, and the uh, uh, agribusiness group, uh, such as uh, uh, Mittapong. The last group is newly emerging group. The very typical case is the hospital and medical service. In Bangkok, the city medical service is now one of the largest the, uh, capital operating hospital in Asia. So Cambodia's the international level the hospital is operated by this the, uh, Thai groups, uh, BGH. Okay. And now the strategy and uh, uh, means to expand of these Thai local firms, I is to pick up to the five uh, major points. First one is now local firms is use the selection and concentration. So not diversification, but to select the most two or the three major industries, such as the CP group, is the 7-Eleven convenience store, one, agro-industry, two, and the third is the telecommunications, three items, three industries. And the second point, uh, second point is the utilization of land as the strategic asset. So please look at these figures. Uh, during the economic boom between the 1988 and uh, just before the Asian crisis, 1997, land price is surprisingly increased, jump up around 30 times. And then it's constantly is the land price in Bangkok area is increasing. So I remember in the 30 years ago, land has no meaning. It is not a collateral for commercial bank because the, there is no value. But after the crisis, several big business groups collect, collect, collect the land from the 
other groups who are faced the collapse in business. And the TCC or the Charun Pokapan group is now largest landowner in Thailand, exceeding the king now. And this the CP or the TCC is now, this the land is a very important asset when they borrow the money from commercial bank. And also this group is set up the property fund and to easily fight, uh, fund raising by using a land. This is a new trend in Thai economy. And the third point, third point means that it's now, Thai local firms is now use the M&A, merging and acquisition. So the, it's now, merging and acquisition is now conducted not only in the inside the Thailand, but outside Thailand. A uh, good case is the CP group. It's now CP group is the, provides the capital of the 50% of Ping An life insurance in mainland China. Ping An life insurance is the second largest uh, the insurance company in China. And uh, the cost of taking over this uh, uh, company is around uh, 9 billion US dollar. And the CP group also, two years ago, the uh, take over the big uh, store, super store from Dutch Saya Macro, and it, the cost is around uh, 4 billion US dollar. So now they are invested huge amount of money to the M&A and expand the business outside Thailand. And the first point is now, this local farm is now target for the not Europe or the United States, but the neighboring country, especially the CLMV, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and uh, Vietnam. So the uh, pink color is the uh, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. So the Siam Cement, CP Group, Betagro, Betagro is agro-industry, the broiler chicken, Mittapon, sugar, TCC and uh, Italian Thai development uh, construction uh, firms is now target is the CLMV. And uh, last point, it's a new alliance, business alliance with China. So for the past five years, the local Thai firms is now very active in setting up the new joint venture with the firms in mainland China. So the, this the pink line is a CP group. Now CP group is now a joint venture with Shanghai Motor in China and start to the assembling the compact car in Thailand in competing with Japanese assembler or the American assembler in the local market. This is the first experience for local farms to start the production of passenger car. It needs the technological cooperation from China. And the CP also is the uh, CITIC, very big conglomerate in China, joint venture with this the, uh, company in collaboration with Japanese Chu, uh, C Ito or the Ito Chu. So that now CP is diversified the business in non-agro industry in collaboration with the Chinese farms. So now I conclude. Usually the middle income trap means every country is expected to the step up into a category of high income country. From the low income country to the lower middle income country and the upper middle income country and finally is the target is the high income countries. But if Thailand would like to the enter into the high income country, high income country is the some the uh, member of OECD and the average the uh, per, per capita income is the, around the 30,000 US dollar per head. So it takes Thailand takes around 43 years. And 43 years, Thailand is always seeking for the innovation 
and the effort of the upgrading industrial structure of Thailand. I think Thai people cannot do more because the Thai people is more enjoyed the life, social life, and the severe competition in the world market is not suitable for the Thai people's the lifestyle. So that now I think Thailand maybe is the seeking for alternative. Japan, Korea, Taiwan is the share the similar growth pattern. So upgrading the industrial structure and always is the seek for the innovation in production level, manufacturing. But Thailand is now, I think that the non-manufacturing sector, especially sub-sector, is a very suitable the sector for Thailand. So many domestic resources and uh, Thailand show the hospitality and wellness and I think that this is a good competitive advantage for Thailand. So the, my policy advice is now Thailand should not follow the same pattern of China, Taiwan, or Korea, but uh, should find the own positioning in the regional market of Asia. Stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's a Terrific, very detailed uh, explanation, and we, we, we've, we've now dived into the micro side. I want to I want to shift uh, slowly to a little bit more macro picture. Luis, can you uh, offer some thoughts about uh, about Suihiro Sensei's presentation of view, or, or some of your own observations from from the recent uh, consultations about how this fits uh, with the IMF view? Sure. And let me start by thanking uh, you, Jim, and Carnegie for the invitation. Um, you know, two, two big benefits. One is uh, meeting John and Professor Soedo. I've been working with Thailand uh, for about two years, and I really have not come across somebody who's so knowledgeable of the Thai economy and the history of Thailand, and who's written so much as Professor Soedo. So it's really a privilege to, to be here and to hear him. And, Certainly, I've learned a lot from his presentation. I found the, the business angle very, very interesting. And it's something that we at the fund don't always look at. Perhaps we should more. Uh, but we focus on the macro economy, on growth, on inflation, on the fiscal situation at the aggregate level. So um, let me react to Professor Suaido's uh, presentation by sharing uh, with you our view of the economy of Thailand um, as it relates to, to his presentation. And we see Thailand very much in a transition, political transition, social transition, economic transition. Probably the next 20 years are going to be very different to the last 20 years in Thailand. Um, and this is a moment of change. At the same time, the Thais are looking inward. They're looking inward in terms of their politics, in terms of the monarchy, in terms of a number of issues that are very important to the Thai people. While the world is moving around them, you have China, Japan, Southeast Asia, very dynamic uh, regions where change is happening very, very quickly. Now, overall, we are very optimistic about the economy of Thailand. Mm. Uh, they have challenges and some important challenges uh, today, but they have made uh, good decisions in the past and they have created an economy which is quite diversified. It has a world-class export sector, in part uh, influenced by FDIs and multinational corporations, whether it's the electronics or the automobile, but also very dynamic tourism, service sector. So they have built a, a complex economy and if you take a picture of the economy today, at least at how economists look at, you know how doctors, when you go to your annual checkup, they look at your uh, blood pressure and cholesterol and so forth. Well, economists look at four or five things. We look at balance sheets of the government, the debt, corporate sector, the financial sector, the level of reserves, uh, past growth, the quality of policy making. Do the authorities know what they're doing? 
Have they dealt with crisis? What happens if there's a crisis? Will they panic? Have they done this before? And so forth. Well, under sort of the standard uh, economic checkup, Thailand comes out very strong. High reserves, good balance sheets. The corporate sector is making a lot of money. They've increased their capital. Their leverage, their debt is low by international standards. Much of it is in domestic currency. Some of the large players that the professor mentioned have borrowed internationally in foreign currency, but to finance some of these purchases, so their balance sheets are reasonably hedged. So we see strong economic fundamentals. Even though growth has been very lousy, really, the last four or five years, and last year, but, and that's, in our view, due to a number of reasons. First of all, the professor mentioned exports. That's very important. That's the most dynamic, historically, sector of the Thai economy, and it has not done very well. In part because the electronic sector might be facing some, you know, structural challenges. Do people still buy fax machines or digital cameras or hard drives? Uh, or is the technology moving elsewhere and the global demand? That's a question. Also, agriculture was hit by low prices on the one hand, but also this rice uh, policy that was intended to try to, you know, be a little small OPEC. You know, you, you reduce the supply, prices would go up. And, but the problem was that as Thailand pulled back from the world markets, other players like Vietnam and India took advantage and you know, sort of flooded the world markets with their own stocks. So agriculture, shrimp diseases have all affected exports, the electronic side. So it's hard to see a clear picture yet. Time will tell whether they're facing sort of fundamental structural issues there or a cyclical downturn because external demand has also been low and global trade has been growing very slowly. Unlike the past, trade is growing in a slower way than global output. Now, uh, looking forward, we see that Thailand needs to support growth in the short run, especially through fiscal policy, and in particular, investing in those areas that increase potential growth, like infrastructure, uh, much of the transport is done through highways. These are very clogged. One of the historical advantages of Thailand vis-a-vis, -vis, say, Indonesia or even Vietnam has been the infrastructure, access to ports. That has become a bit of a problem. So infrastructure is very important. The, this government and the previous governments, in plural, have tried many large infrastructure projects without much success for many reasons. Um, we see that in terms of the financial sector, the Thais have built a very, very robust supervisory and regulatory regime, institutions, that cover commercial banks. They are going to extend that oversight by the central bank, the Bank of Thailand, to their public banks, which have grown a lot. And Professor Suido mentioned about housing and how it has grown in the last few years. Well, a lot of that funding came from the public banks which expanded their balance sheets quite a bit and are less uh, regulated currently and supervised than commercial banks. So on the financial sector, Thailand has done very well. Their stock exchange is very dynamic. It's uh, competing you know, head on with Singapore. They have a, a very uh, good bond market, uh, mostly government bonds, some corporate bonds, but they have developed that quite a bit. But more in the medium term, we do see strong headwinds to growth. And again, Professor mentioned aging. Aging will happen according to the studies of the OECD, the UN, and even the NESDB in uh, Thailand, the planning ministry, very quickly in Thailand. So Thailand is a middle-income country with sort of high-income country demographics. Uh, and that's a challenge in terms of the labor force, in terms of the public finances, in terms of savings and investment it will have big economic implications. Now, uh, we think that Thailand should upgrade their immigration policies quite a bit. You know, Singapore has very sophisticated immigration policies. Even New Zealand has some interesting programs that perhaps the Thai should look at for the South Pacific Islands. Uh, and not only sort of low-skilled workers, which play a very big role in agriculture, shrimp production, and so forth, but 
skilled worker. Just a few days ago, there was an article in the Financial Times that you may have seen of the troubles that Google had trying to move an engineer from Malaysia to Bangkok mm -hmm. because the immigration system is still handled by the national security people, or at least the national security. So foreigners are potentially a threat. They need to be controlled. Whereas if they're going to develop the health sector, if they're going to face the demographic trends, they need to upgrade their immigration uh, policies. And of course, training. That's very important training. There's, and here we rely very much on the research of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not experts on education and training, but the bank has done some work on skills mismatches. You know, mm -hmm. too many bachelors are not enough vocational trained workers. Overqualified and skilled. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So these are kind of the policies that we see uh, will help mm -hmm. Thailand address their challenges of mid uh, in the midterm and um, in the middle and um, medium and long term growth. Uh, finally, I think that going back to my first point, we are optimistic about Thailand. Not only have they done many things right in the past, but they are lucky. They get along well with everybody, with the Chinese, with the Japanese, with the Americans, I think. No, they do get along well with the Americans. They might have right now some issues with the uh, with what's happened in May uh, of last year, but overall, you know, over a long period of time, relations of Thailand with pretty much everybody, with the small exception, maybe not so small, of Cambodia and this um, dispute over the temple and the border, Thailand gets along well with everybody. And many things are happening that are indirectly benefiting Thailand. First, Japan has increased FDI to Southeast Asia quite a bit in the last two, three years. Thailand has benefited from that. Although Thailand has not only benefited, other countries have too, like Vietnam and Indonesia. Thailand is now facing competition, unlike, say, 20 years ago, to attract Japanese FDI. There are other players in the neighborhood. China, China's now moving to try to develop the inland part of the country, not just the coast. And they're talking about three new silk roads, one maritime and two land. Well, one of the land silk roads will apparently, reportedly, uh, affect Thailand, and the Chinese are interested in developing railroads that will link the south of China to the Thai ports, and they're willing to pay for it. They're willing to bring the workers, do the work. And it's not a business decision, apparently, reportedly, but it's more a strategic decision of the Chinese that will benefit. And finally, but not least important, Thailand is in the middle of a super dynamic neighborhood. Professor Toito mentions the MLV and the investments of Thai corporates in the neighborhood. It's huge. It's huge and it's very dynamic and official statistics greatly under report the linkages between Thailand and Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar. And many multinational corporations view Thailand as the hub for the Indochina uh, region. So they have their central offices in Bangkok, and then they have their factories or their local offices in the, and this is a very dynamic, fast growing uh, region, which is highly connected to the south of China, Kuming and, and so forth. So again, geography very much plays in the favor of Thailand and generates a number of strategic opportunities that the Thais historically have been very good at taking advantage of. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very interesting talk. Well, thank you, Luis. That's, uh, that's great context, and I, that, that, that really adds to the discussion. Let's, let's go even broader still, a little beyond just the economic focus and, and weave in some of the social, political uh, in addition. And so, John, I, I turn to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel, and I've, um, like Luis, I very much enjoyed uh, um, Professor Suhiro's uh, um, comments uh, about the economy. He clearly knows it uh, well. Uh, as Jim said, I'm going to uh, focus more sort of like on the, uh, the political and social dynamics of all this economic growth. Um, I first went to Thailand in 1978. 
And uh, <coughs> at that time, the per capita income was $482 a year. Uh, I made more in one month than um, the average Thai made and um, the um, te teaching English. Um, to see the economic growth going back, you know, over the last 20 years, I've probably been back to Thailand over 100 times. Um, it's just truly remarkable. You know, today the per capita income growth is probably about $6,000, not taking into account uh, purchasing power uh, parity. Um, and the, uh, you know, the double digit growth that uh, in the late 80s and the early 90s, uh, you know, had this incredible boom and in even higher uh, single digit growth up until the Asian financial crisis. Mm -hmm. But uh, it rebounded well from the crisis, albeit with, you know, with difficulty like any country would be experiencing uh, until, you know, really maybe the last, um, within the last 10 years because of the, uh, the political challenges that the, uh, the country um, has been, um, been facing. And there are a number of challenges that the, the country's facing that I don't think any government uh, has really been able to focus on um, uh, with proper attention. Um, one thing, some things that we haven't talked about that you know, clearly impact uh, on the economy is corruption, uh, environmental degradation, uh, education reform, which we have touched a little bit on it in terms of what, the, uh, what Thailand needs in, in terms of an educated population. But probably the, the first um, and maybe foremost issue is uh, wealth inequality. Uh, in the in the country, um, despite the um, significant economic growth over the last thirty years, that that in income inequality has uh, has has widened. It hasn't it hasn't narrowed. I mean, if you look at it, the richest twenty percent of of Thailand's population controls seventy percent of the wealth. The lowest uh, twenty percent controls four percent. That leaves um, the remaining uh, 26, um, uh, the, re the remaining 60 percent of the country's population with 26 percent of uh, of the wealth, and really this lower um, lower class, lower middle income class group of people uh, has formed the base, <coughs> uh, the political base for uh, Thaksin uh, Shinawat and, and uh, his sister uh, Yingluck. And um, the, uh, they came into power in 2000. They announced uh, these um, uh, various um, um, uh, social development uh, schemes, populist policies, uh, universal health care, um, the uh, agricultural uh, subsidies, um, including low interest agricultural loans, the village development funds, uh, and th these um, uh, th these policies were very uh, very popular with this segment of the population that resonated. And you have to give, uh, in one sense, whatever Thaksin Shinawat, whatever his shortcomings might be, one thing he did do that no Thai politician uh, has, has, uh, had done before is that he said, these are my policies. If you uh, elect me, I will implement them. And he did. And uh, I think it gave this group of people a sense of, of, of voice, of, of empowerment. And uh, as I said, I think he's let the, he's let the genie, uh, genie out of the bottle. Um, but even regardless of, of, of these schemes, whether they worked, they, they've been effective or not, and that is quite debatable. Um, the, um, you look at the social services and how the social services have been, um, uh, have been distributed. Bangkok has 14% of um, the country's population. 70% um, of uh, health and education expenditures in the country go to Bangkok. Now the Northeast, uh, which has been the strongest base for um, Thaksin Shinawat and his supporters, uh, is um, the largest region in the country, uh, has 34% of the population, and, but only 6% of these expenditures uh, have, uh, have, you know, have gone to them. Now, there has been a government that was opposed to Thaksin. The Democrats, when they were in power from 2008 to 2011, uh, what they did is that they, they perpetuated and, and mimicked and perpetuated you know, the, these policies, they remain the same. And so I think any government who's ever in power is going to have a big challenge to say, how do you, you know, how do you draw back? What kind of suitable, you know, compromise might, you know, might there be? I mean, what didn't happen when these policies were introduced to say there was no serious debate on what 
these policies would mean for the country. What would be the you know overall? How would it impact on the country? That that debate never happened by uh, by other side. And when I talked with um, someone who was um, a senior Thai government official um, who wasn't particularly enamored with Toxin, and I asked, well, you know, why? Uh, why do you continue with these policies? Why don't you try to change them? And he says, John, um, we believe that by continuing these policies, um, uh, Kuntoxin's policies, we believe the, Demo uh, the, the Thai people will believe that these are the Democrats' policies. Well, obviously that didn't work. Uh, and so what, what now, whether in this, inter you know, this military government for how long it remains in place or, or for any uh, future uh, government uh, elected um, uh, or not. Um, you also look at, if you look at um, 50 years ago, the average Thai was born, lived, and died within a 10-mile radius of, uh, you know, of, of where, they, you know, where they grew up. And compulsory education uh, was four years. When I lived there, compulsory education was, was, was four years. And access to information came from uh, village headman or the district chief, the employees in the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, the radio stations were owned by the military, and, and so were all, uh, and the three uh, television stations in the country. There was no cable. Um, and uh, so what you had is um, the government being able to control all information, but you know, over the you know over the years, ties have become better educated, and it's kind of country has become a victim of its own success. They expanded education from four years and then up to eight, and it's now twelve. Um, and they're uh, they have access to the internet. Uh, they, uh, in terms of um, um, social uh, social media, uh, they. Um, you know, it's one of the most uh, countries that, that where the social media, it, you know, really has taken uh, taken hold in terms of uh, um, Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, mobile phones, um, things of uh, of, uh, of that sort, and people, rural people having the opportunity to go to college, not necessarily having to go to Bangkok any longer. A lot of universities and, uh, opened, uh, opened up throughout the country uh, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last 30 years, so opportunity has been closer to home. They have uh, cable TV. Uh, and so all of these things, you know, it's been a good thing in the one sense. It, it was good during the flooding of 2011 in terms of the social media, being able to inform people on how the flood was impacting and, and, and what to do, how to mobilize. For better or worse, in 2013 and 2014, social media was also used in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the demonstrations that were taking place in the country between uh, November of 2013 and, and, and May of, uh, in May of last year. So what you have is a population who is no longer complacent. You know, they're not going to just sort of listen to what the Puyai Ban, the village headman, uh, says or what might come over the, uh, you know, the um, uh, government um, TV and, and radio. Uh, they have their own views and they're exposed to not just views by other people in Thailand but from throughout, um, you know, from throughout the world. And so um, the current government is trying to, where they feel, uh, it's it's important. They're trying to put a lid on the social media. The question is whether they really can or not, uh, especially when it comes to anyone who might be criticizing um, the um, um, the current uh, the current current government. Um, you know, talking about how much the country has grown. You know, it's been always a traditionally historically a, a rural based uh, economy, and 40 percent of the people of Thailand are still engaged in agriculture. But it only contributes 8% of GDP growth. So how, does, how do these people who have felt um, that they're, they're seeing this growth because they have access to you know, all different types of media, uh, how, do they, how do they feel, well, I, wanna, I want a bigger slice of the pie? And, I, um, and can you really say you, you, know, you blame them? So how is Thailand? How are, how are uh, policymakers going to create an economy that feels that um, people will feel that they have a, a larger uh, a larger stake um, uh, in this? Uh, the um, um, as been mentioned, Thailand does have a sufficient um, 
doesn't have a sufficient labor supply to meet its demand, and so the low-skilled workers have come from uh, from neighboring uh, countries. Uh, it has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the world, less than 1 percent. I think it's 0.7 uh, um, percent. Um, but its future economic health is uh, inextricably bound to a mix of domestic uh, economic policy considerations, and Thailand's place in uh, an increasingly um, integrated regional economic and uh, social cultural uh, community as embodied under the ASEAN Charter that was passed about six, seven years ago. Um, but what role is Thailand going to play in this? Uh, it has, um, uh, it, it's the, the second largest economy in Southeast Asia. Uh, it is the largest economy in the mainland. It's four times larger than, um, than, Vietnam, um, than Vietnam, and it's exponentially larger than, you know, Cambodia, Myanmar, and, and, and Laos's uh, economies. I take the, um, my, my colleagues on the panel's point about um, education. Uh, I think particularly in its technical and vocational training uh, and the, uh, as a basis for a skilled workforce. Um, they, um, Thailand hasn't really adequately prepared its young to meet the demands of an economically integrated uh, ASEAN region. Um, the Thai government is, uh, spends almost 20 percent of its national budget, and when the military government came into power uh, in May and they passed the budget a couple of months later, they actually increased the budget by 5.3 uh, percent. But, you know, if you look at historically, Thailand's education ministry has been rife with um, corruption, uh, there's unqualified teachers, and, and an outdated curriculum that's out of sync with the future employment market uh, uh, and, and the demands of an integrated um, regional economy. Um, so, um, but at the same time, uh, Thailand has the potential to play an important role in uh, mainland Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, uh, and, and, and in the Asia-Pacific uh, more, you know, more broadly. Uh, but the political distractions that have taken place, you know, over the past decade, I think, have hindered uh, policymakers' ability to, um, to do that. And so um, let, me, um, let me end there uh, and be happy to, you know, entertain questions and comments. Thank you. That's great, John. Thank you very much. That really rounds out the picture. Um, before I open it up to the audience for, we have a few minutes for questions, but Suihiro Sensei, do you have any comments or reactions based on the uh, discussions comments and if I can ask you to to maybe weave in or address a little bit uh, what do you think Japan is doing or should be doing to, to support Thailand in this transition uh, that, that partly that you talked about and and that uh, the others have talked about as well so kind of the, the, the Tokyo view a little bit in addition to your own yes uh, so and uh, Mr. Rui is the mention is the some fundamentals of Thai macroeconomy and also micro sector. So the, I did not refer to this point as a fundamental or the uh, not, not competitiveness fundamentals in the macroeconomy and the micro sector. So the, I agree to the fiscal policy, financial sector, agriculture, or the education. So many the weakness in Thai macroeconomy. And the many scholars is the, uh, say that the Thailand is the very good country to manage the sound, sound the macroeconomy. But uh, it is not uh, different from the uh, fundamentals of the macroeconomy. I think that now the Japanese government is not cooperate strategy or the business activity in micro sector. Must, uh, so the, our Japanese government or the uh, Tokyo should look at the fundamentals of the macro and micro. Uh, micro sector means the balance sheet. So the, looking at the, I, I introduced the many uh, local big business groups. Is the uh, Siam Cement Groups, PTT, a uh, good uh, balance sheet. But other some groups, it's uh, quite different from the uh, leading companies. And also the SMEs. As now, Thai government, also Japanese government support to the SMEs, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, is uh, some supporting industry for the export, uh, for, uh, help, helping the growth of the uh, export-oriented industry. But SMEs now not so grow, uh, not so enjoyed the growth after the Asian crisis. So the 
this morning session, I only introduce the sum, the business activity and the corporate strategy. But uh, such a the macro policy is now closely related to the public sector and the government. And also education. Education is now, uh, it's very surprising now. The number of students enrolled in high education is now larger than the Japan now, percentage. It's very surprising. So the, but quality is now only the number of the student. And that is the very low service in education, especially the countryside. And also, this is a very crucial, the problem is now facing the Thai education is a big mismatch between the labor market and the education, insti educational institution, university and the labor market. So the Ministry of Education push, push, promote the some uh, universal type of education, but labor market needs more vocational type of education. So th this is the, I already said, overqualify and underskill become the big problem facing Thailand. And now, it's very interesting. Now, who is now promote the suitable educational system is uh, in line with the changes in the labor market. Now, not the public sector, but the private company is now set up the own university and own educational institution to meet their real needs in labor market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, available, so uh, I'll take some questions. Uh, when a microphone comes to you, please just let us know who you are and, and where you're from. and, and uh, and ask away. So I'll start with this gentleman here. Thanks. Uh, my name is Nick Boros. I'm with TDI. Um, question about Dawe. I'd like to hear just your thoughts on what are the prospects for this project. It's kind of off and on again, but recently good news. Um, what that indicates about the Myanmar-Thailand relationship and more generally Japan's influence in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Professor, I'll let you address first. The way in Myanmar. Last year, I tried to visit the Dawe, but the still road is not so good, so I give up. And uh, <laughs> now, of course, as the Myanmar government and the Thai government would like to invite the Japan, Japanese government to uh, help and uh, cooperate to the development of Dawe and uh, some Thai companies, not only Italian Thai development, but uh, Amata Corporation or the Saha, uh, Saha Group is now start to promote the business. But I think that uh, it's very difficult to promote this project. First one is how to recruit the labor force in this area. It's very isolated. So the Japanese farm is now preferred to the Yangon, not that way. And uh, so the, it takes so many times. But on the other hand, and especially the standpoint, viewpoint of the Japanese farm, the way is very important to the uh, pollution industry, such as the steel plant. Because in inside Thailand, it is now impossible to set up a new plant in steel industry. So the Japanese farm now would like to shift the steel plant from Thailand to Dawe. So the, in this sense, the, some Japanese groups is now looking at the Dawe carefully. But uh, broadly speaking, is now it takes a long, long time. Thank you. Any other thoughts from the panel on Dawe? Or? I'll just take one. The, um, is the, I mean, this is all part of what we've all talked about in to, to some extent about the um, ASEAN ec economic community um, and the, um, uh, the connectivity or the, the in, and that's basically the co-term for infrastructure uh, development and, and, and uh, integration. Um, the, uh, the cost of it, as pr uh, Professor Suhiro said, is, um, is expensive. Uh, my sense is, is that the Japanese seem to be more um, optimistic about uh, Thilawa uh, <laughs> yeah. um, estate than, uh, you know, than, than Dawe. And so um, I, I just wanted to make mention of yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and, and clearly, as we've talked about, to the extent 
neighboring countries succeed in their economic investment programs and draw potentially labor back, maybe that has gone to Thailand and has been working there, that's going to put additional pressure on, on, the, on the labor force down the line, but um, for good reasons. Uh, so that's, that's positive, but, but another challenge nonetheless. Um, here in the front. Um, my name is Kunihiko Kawazu, uh, Embassy of Japan. Uh, thank you for the very insightful discussion uh, today. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is uh, to uh, Professor Suehiro, one is to Mr. Uh, Broya. Uh, the, to Mr. Suehiro, uh, your uh, chart uh, showed us that the uh, automobile share, uh, uh, automobile sector uh, is growing in the uh, Thai economy. And Toyota is uh, ranked on a high uh, list of your chart. So uh, uh, this, this, uh, this happened in the first decade of uh, this century, 21st century. And uh, uh, this timing uh, coincides with uh, the uh, discussion about uh, uh, Japan Thai uh, FTA. Uh, we uh, negotiated, we signed, and uh, this uh, FTA entered into force uh, uh, 2008. So uh, the, what is your assessment about uh, the uh, 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 effect of uh, FTA uh, in this uh, development uh, like uh, automobile sector? This is uh, the first question uh, to Mr. Suehiro. To Mr. Broya, your uh, 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 the, uh, analysis about uh, the uh, potential uh, competition among ASEAN countries, this is a very interesting point. Uh, in this context, uh, the, uh, we are now uh, the negotiating the TPP. Uh, TPP includes uh, the four ASEAN uh, countries, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and uh, Vietnam. So uh, what is your uh, recipe or prescription to the Thai uh, government uh, uh, in relation to uh, the TPP uh, possible uh, participation for, for Thai government? Thank you very much. <coughs> Just the uh, inside story is the Toyota Group is there. In the initial stage, they would like to set up the regional core center. It's not in Thailand, but in Indonesia. But in those days, Suharto is now is more uh, localized, the assembling of car. And in those days, Malaysia is also follow the same policy. And Thailand is only one country to the open the market to the uh, foreigner. So the uh, Toyota is the start to the, uh, make some hub center or the uh, clustering of the automobile industry in Thailand and continue to expand this the investment. And the FTA is only one element. In those days, B and B scheme, B2B scheme, so the, I asked the Toyota people say that you use the B2B scheme, B2B scheme, brand to brand. It's just uh, um, similar to the free trade agreement uh, on the automobile inside the ASEAN countries. So the uh, Toyota has no interest, but in actuality, 75% is used by this the agreement. It's the uh, low, low customers. So the FTA is one of the elements to pushing the clustering. Thank you. Luis? Um, in terms of um, <clears throat> regional integration processes. Of course, TPP is a very important one. Um, there's also RCEP. Uh, and the ties, my impression is, are not really focusing on these processes as much as they have historically, at least in the mid-2000s when they did take an active role in, in regional trade uh, negotiations, uh, to a large extent because of their internal political uh, reasons. Now. When I spoke of competition, I was referring to competition for uh, FDI, and especially Japanese FDI, because other countries have come up that were not there 20 years ago, at least in the same magnitude, like Indonesia, Vietnam, and so forth. Uh, though Thailand remains the main hub of <clears throat> Japanese FDI. Um, Certainly in terms of our policy advice, market access is very important. And to the extent that TPP will um, improve that for Thailand, then it would be a good thing. Now, this is an issue that involves many countries, including the authorization to negotiate in the US. 
So the prospects are not very clear to us, whether this is an imminent uh, issue. There's the first uh, generation of countries that are negotiating. I understand they've decided not to include new countries until a, a later phase. So it's, even if Thailand were to want to join it now, I'm not sure they would be able to. Uh, I'm going to take one last question. Unfortunately, we started a little bit late, so, uh, so we didn't have uh, as much time as usual for questions. But uh, gentlemen, you get the last question. Thank you, Raj. Uh, David Merkel with the Atlantic Council. Uh, I think the, the FDI question I, I, I had was largely answered, but I, was, I, was, um, I took note that in the recent visit to, to Tokyo that the, um, their focus was on interim prime minister and he didn't stay at the normal guest house. And Abe uh, spent more time in the meeting on, on the state of emergency and democracy. So maybe just a little bit more on the, on the bilateral relationship with, with Japan. But my main question was with, with, with regard to the drafting of the Constitution and what, what elements of that are of concern to you. Thank you. Terrific. So we'll wrap up. You want to start there? We'll, we'll go reverse. Um, I mean, in terms of the drafting of the Constitution, I mean, They've, you know, they're talking about elections now in, in early 2016. How will those uh, elections look? Um, there seems to be, you know, right now, given the uh, martial law, no more than five people are allowed to gather. So um, technically, no political party can be able to talk and to strategize uh, for uh, what would happen in 2016. And so, uh, um, to me, it becomes a question of, of whether there will, um, you might not see the, the politicians, uh, not just from the, the Puatai or any iteration of that under Thaksin, but you may not find uh, people um, from the Democratic Party, like um, uh, opposite Vijayjiva, who was the you know, prime minister between 2008 and 2011. And I wonder, um, and I don't know about uh, friends here at the embassy and what they're, you know, what they're thinking is that maybe um, there could be, uh, well, two things. If, if the Democrats were allowed to run, uh, would there be a split? Uh, I don't think they've been terribly effective. Uh, and would they be um, weakened and it would be divided along between um, uh, former Prime Minister Opisit and, and his supporters and then Sutep Thongsaban, who, who um, uh, support, um, headed the PDRC that helped basically eventually come to, uh, bring the coup about, uh, and the money men uh, of the Democratic Party, uh, they, they, may, um, they may split. But I don't think they have, uh, anyone has seen any, the Democrats certainly have not seen any gains. In terms of the Constitution, uh, you know, they've talked about, well, it would go up for a referendum, but I'm not so sure if it, uh, if it would. Uh, they may just decide to pass it, and, uh, the, uh, and then, you know, the, the Thai people would live with that, and the question would be is, you know, who will, you know uh, whether the, how supportive they would be or, or, or not be. But I, I think what this is all about is that the, um, the military wants to um, vanquish uh, Thaksin Shinawat and his supporters and to be able to uh, neutralize them so that they cannot be a political force. Whether they will succeed or not still remains to be determined. Uh, but they will, um, uh, they will come up with a, a, a set of parameters that um, I think will help them work to, um, or that they'll their desire is to work to uh, that endeavor. So you may not have the elected politicians that um, have been around for the last uh, 20, you know, 20 years or so. Uh, you may um, have people who uh, have um, technocratic, you know, might be a more technocratic um, run, uh, run government. So um, those are my hmm. initial thoughts. Thank you. It. So Hiro Sensei, the last word to you. Any final thoughts on kind of uh, Tokyo's approach to, to, yeah. to the uh, interview? Uh, to, to comment it, I already mentioned that now, Thailand is experience is a very big turning point in politics, economy, and uh, society. So there is now a very transition, an era of transition in the social change, political change, and economic change. And uh, Tokyo side is focused on the particular point, separate economy from politics, or the, they discuss about only politics and neglecting the social change and the political change. So the, I would like to integrate 
is the three aspect into the one more comprehensive view or an understanding on Thailand, not only Thailand but Asia. I think that I suggest to the Tokyo side is the more comprehensive approach is needed in, in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, your presentation today, Suhiro Sensei, and, and to the, our discussants contributions. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for your, for your time and preparation. Thank you for joining us, and, and please join me in, in thanking our, our, our presenters.